Hey, and uh, we tried to upgrade the uh, the prize, and uh, we, with financial support from the uh, John S. Knight Foundation, hence the present name of the prize, the Knight Risser Prize for Western Environmental Journalism, uh, we managed to endow the prize and this symposium so that it will go on uh, in perpetuity. And I have to say that among the aspects of this little bit of history that I've just rehearsed for you that I'm most proud of and pleased with is the fact that we made the decision early on when we partnered with uh, the Knight Fellows Program, not simply to give the prize, but to use the occasion of the award giving to uh, reflect in a symposium like we're about to have here today on why this reporting in any given year was prize worthy, uh, what makes it, uh, gives it a command uh, on our attention, and how other journalists might learn from studying at, at a more granular level the, the work that was done. So uh, we're not just in the award and recognition business, we're in the education business, and it's part of our mission at the Bill Lane Center, not only to encourage uh, teaching and research about the West, but also public education and public engagement. And of course, the most obvious way to do that is through the media and through the work of journalists. So we're very, very happy to partner with the Night Journalism uh, Fellows Program and with journalists in all media everywhere uh, in order to uh, promote better understanding of this great uh, Western region. So I repeat my welcome to all of you. Uh, congratulations to the prize winners. And I'm gonna turn it over to my other half here on this occasion, Jim Bettinger. to be described as David Kennedy's other half. <laughs> um, I want to offer my welcome as well. Um, we're gathered here for two reasons, to recognize and celebrate the winners of the 2012 Knight Risser Prize for Western Environmental Journalism and to participate in this so symposium on the issues raised in the winning entry. And what a winning entry it was. I want to hearken back to a saying uh, that I heard uh, among photojournalists long ago, which was the key to success was, F8 and be there, and I think that the wonders uh, that, the, that this prize, this, uh, this story um, is, uh, it does remind us how important it is, even with all the technology, to be there. Um, Will, uh, her editor said of Emmeline's determination to monitor the migration patterns of migrant uh, pronghorn antelopes, quote, she got lost in drainages, battled through thick brush, and postholed her way through deep snow. Joe's challenges as a photographer were similar. Quote, Reese also hiked and explored the corridor, scouting locations where he could set remote cameras that would capture the essence of migration in close-up, wide-frame cameras that could provide rare glimpses of antelope in motion and the landscape through which they moved. Well, we'll be learning in a few, more, a few minutes how they met these challenges as well, as well as the ways that modern technology is revolutionizing the way the images of life, wildlife are captured. But first, I want to introduce the reason there is a Knight Risser Prize in the first place, uh, Jim Risser, my predecessor as director. Jim was a singular figure in 20th century journalism. He distinguished himself as an investigative reporter and an environmental reporter. He won two Pulitzer Prizes and he was leader in the efforts to improve the quality of modern journalism. This prize was created, as David said, in 2005 to honor him. We're lucky to have him join us today, and I'm going to ask Jim to come up and to present the prize. Jim Risser. Thanks, Jim and David. Uh, before I actually present the prize, I just wanted to thank a couple of people. I want to thank Jim Battinger and the Knight Fellowship Program for coming up with the idea of this prize in the first place and getting it started. And I want to thank David Kennedy and the Lane Center for getting involved in it, pushing it, and doing the work that helped lead to an endowment for the program, or for the prize. And of course, the Knight Foundation itself for providing the challenge grant that resulted in the prize being fully funded, but these things would not have happened without both Jim Battinger and David Kennedy, so I'm really grateful to them. Now, I'm proud to be associated with this prize because the environment of the West is so special and precious to all of us, and while it appears that the West is a strong and rugged place, it really has a fragile environment in a lot of ways, as 
as we know, and needs to be protected. And one of the things that can assist in that kind of work is good, vigorous journalism about Western issues. And so I believe that this prize can help and encourage and recognize that kind of journalism. And that's the kind of good, vigorous, probing journalism that our winners today did. I hope you all had a chance outside to look at the at the at their work, the text, the, the beautifully written stories, and also the beautiful photographs that accompanied it. So before I give the winners their award, I just wanted to also say that one of the things that I think makes this prize legitimate and worthy is that they always find some distinguished people to judge the awards uh, and, and decide on the winners. And I really would like to recognize the judges this year and just tell you who they are. One of them is Jim Bruggers, who's environment, longtime environment writer with the Louisville Courier Journal and the former president of the Society of Environmental Journalists. Beth Daly, who's an environment writer for the Boston Globe and is a former Knight Fellow. Raul Ramirez, who some of you from this area know, he's the executive director of news for KQED Public Radio. And Bud Ward, who's the editor of Yale, the Yale Forum on Climate Change in the Media. So a really a great group of judges who went through the entries and uh, made the decision. So uh, I'll call the winners up here in a minute to receive the award. I wanted to say um, beforehand that the judges, uh, as always, it was hard for them to pick a winner, and they did award a special citation to one of, one of the other uh, candidates, who was Linda Mapes of the Seattle Times, for her uh, investigative report about the largest dam removal project in the history of North America. So uh, congratulations to her for that. The, the winners of the prize today are from the High Country News, which is a wonderful newspaper based in Western Colorado. Uh, we've had a winner from that uh, paper before in this prize, and we've actually had uh, at least one fellow, Knight Fellow, from, from that uh, news organization. The, the winners, Emmeline Ostland, the writer, and photographer Joe Reese were the principal um, people on this on this work about the pronghorn antelopes, and they were assisted by contributors Mary Ellen Hannibal and Callie Carswell. And I would now like to bring up the two principals on this, Emmeline and Joe. Would you come up, Emmeline Austin and Joe Reese? Please congratulate them. And. This is, oh, thank you. <laughs> Joe, thank you. congratulations. I guess he wants to take a picture. <laughs> and one of their collaborators, Mary Ellen Hannibal, is here today, too. Mary Ellen, where are you? So terrific. Thank you for being here. You will get a plaque also, and, and so will Callie Carswell. So thank you. Okay, that part of it. I'm through with my part, and I think you two may want to say something. You want to step up here? Okay. Oh, okay, your mic's all right. Good. Okay. Please. All right. Thanks very much, Jim, and, and everybody who has brought us here today. Um, when Joe and I started this project a few years ago, we were both students at the University of Wyoming, and we didn't even know if migration was something that you could see. We didn't know what it would look like. We didn't know if we would be able to get to the places these animals were migrating. And we kind of just jumped in the car one weekend and drove seven hours across the state up to the corner of Wyoming where this was happening and started looking around. And we didn't find anything. We didn't see a single antelope. And we were there for a couple of days kind of trying to figure out how this migration might be happening. And on our way back to Laramie then, we um, stopped at this point along the highway that we had read about. It was called Trapper's Point. And 
uh, as we were hanging out there, a little band of pronghorn that was migrating came down from the north, crawled on the, under the fence, crossed the highway, crawled under the other fence, and continued to the south down to their winter range. And that really just captured our imagination and got us excited about the story. So we spent, as you'll hear, a long time working on it. But even once we started to figure out what migration looked like, we never really imagined the, the reach this story would have or the number of people that we would be able to tell the story to and uh, the number of people whose imaginations would sort of be triggered by this particular story to think about migration and wildlife movement in their backyards. And we certainly never imagined that it would bring us all the way to Stanford University in California. So this is a huge honor and it's a great to know that the story of this migration is reaching even more people today. And um, both of us just feel like it's such a huge treat to, to be here and to have the recognition for the story. So thanks very much for being here. And then I'd like to echo some of Emmeline's comments. Uh, and thank all the Stanford folks that are involved with the prize for having us here, and then also High Country News for publishing the story. And last, I'd like to thank Emmeline. Uh, this whole story idea was her idea, and she came to me with the idea, and all my pictures are inspired by, by her creativity. So, and thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, congratulations again. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Sam Arudin Stewart, who will moderate today's symposium. Sam is a 2012-2013 Knight Fellow and an accomplished photojournalist. He got his start in digital photography in 2000, and among the prominent positions he has held was director of photo coverage for AOL News, Sports, and Entertainment. He's spending the year uh, exploring the use of the newest digital tools in the service of journalism, which makes him ideal to moderate this symposium. Sam? And again. So, so at this point, without any further ado, I want to invite the panelists to join me on stage. Okay, well, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read you bios. I know you've, uh, you've met Emmeline and Joe, but uh, let me tell you a little bit more about them. So, Emmeline Ostlin grew up exploring the Bighorn Mountains and surrounding basin in northern Wyoming. She studied creative nonfiction writing and environmental and natural resources at the University of Wyoming. She spent time at National Geographic Magazine, Wyoming Wildlife Magazine, and High Country News. She now lives in Laramie, Wyoming, where she works as communications coordinator for the University of Wyoming Hobbs School of Environmental and Natural Resources. And sitting next to her is Joe Reese. Joe Reese is a wildlife photojournalist and biologist. His first long-term project focused on pronghorn migration in western Wyoming with writer Emily Noslin. Now he photographs conservation stories for National Geographic. Joe has received a National Geographic Young Explorer Award and an Emmy Award for nature cinematography. Joe's work is shaped by science and conservation and his belief that photography can connect our culture to critical issues facing wildlife and wild places today. Joe is 28 years old and lives in rural South Dakota. And sitting next to Joe is Sue McConnell. Sue McConnell has been a professor in the biology department at Stanford since 1989. In the lab, McConnell and her colleagues study the molecular, genetic, and cellular mechanisms of brain development using the mouse as a model system. At the core of her work, she is trying to understand how neurons know what kind of connections to make. In addition to her work in developmental neurobiology, McConnell is an avid wildlife photographer whose photos have appeared in Smithsonian, Outdoor Photographer, and other magazines. She is particularly interested in the intersection between biology and the arts, and she teaches two courses at Stanford that explore this intersection. And finally, we have Philippe Cohen, Dr. Philippe Cohen is the executive director of Stanford University's Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve. Dr. Cohen is responsible for the continuing ecological health of the preserve and support of research and educational programs. 
He is dedicated to educating people on the importance of biological field stations, such as JRBP, where long-term research can be carried out and work builds on years of research and monitoring. Prior to his current position, Dr. Cohen was first resident director of the University of California Sweeney Granite Mountains Desert Research Center. As director and manager of these biological field stations, he has been involved in land management issues ranging from desert grazing, mining, and water rights, but in recent years has developed a particular interest in issues associated with the urban wildlife interface. And so please welcome our panel today. And so the first thing we're gonna do to start off is actually we have a video, uh, a little two minute segment that will kind of introduce everyone to the pronghorn antelope. Perfect ending. I love the idea that uh, that Emmeline was walking the same the same path with the pronghorn, and, and she'll as she'll tell you, it's uh, it took a long time to figure that out. So, so Joe and Emmeline, you alluded to the fact that uh, this piece took a while to uh, to create, but uh, I know that this story developed over over several years. So, can you speak a little bit about to the original genesis of the idea and how maybe the story evolved over that time? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so Emmeline was just coming back to Wyoming, and uh, and I was a senior, I was an undergrad in zoology at University of Wyoming, and she came back, and she called me up, and she says, hey, I got this idea, we should write about and photograph this pronghorn migration, and uh, so that's when we took that drive up to the corridor, we were, in, in, we were both in college, and uh, <clears throat> and for me, it was a perfect reason not to get a job after I graduated. <laughs> so, so, so we applied for grants, or, and we applied for several small grants, and we were lucky we were awarded them, and uh, <clears throat> that's how it started rolling. It was in 2008, and so the first time, and you can talk about this, Emily, but the, the first, like the first field work, she, she tried to hike the corridor to see actually where these animals were going because we didn't know exactly where they were going. There were some, some collaring studies in the past, but um, some of that information is not very precise, so you have to get on the ground to figure out where they're going. And she hiked up the wrong, actually the wrong drainage the first time. And then the second time we hiked together and we figured out kind of where they were going. And, uh, and then, yeah, so for each of these expeditions into the migration corridor, 
we were trying to see the animals migrating. We wanted to see pronghorn crossing over the mountains. And we had this set of maps that had uh, GPS waypoints on them from a couple of animals that had been collared in a study. So the maps had great information. They told us how long the corridor was, the general path it followed, the time of year these animals were moving. Um, but they also, the maps raised a lot of questions because we could see lines of antelope crossing rivers, crossing highways, and especially going over this 9,100 foot pass in the Grovant Mountains, which is not pronghorn habitat. That is not the kind of terrain where you would expect to see these animals up in the forests and mountain valleys. So we, were, we wanted to just get out there, figure out the exact route the animals were using and what it looked like on the ground and hopefully try to follow the animals or kind of intercept them as they were going through on the migration. But we sure didn't find that for the first year, the first spring, the first fall. We, we did start finding hoof prints in the mud, which was actually a really good indication to help us pinpoint trails. And we'd find things like, um, in one area right outside Grand Teton National Park, there's a little pronghorn trail going over this hill and then it crossed a frozen beaver pond. We could see like smears of mud out on the beaver pond and continued up the other side. I found that on that spot on one hike and then I was able to tell Joe about it so he could go back the following season to that beaver pond and set up a camera there and see what he could find. So it was, it was a lot of expeditions through this corridor of different lengths and time frames spread out over uh, a spring, a fall, a spring, a fall, a couple of years like that. Um, so it's interesting the collaboration of, I guess, the high technology, which would be the GPS usage to map this out, but then also the, the you know, dare I say, boots on the ground. That is, you know, the, the low technology that did this. But I think one of the reasons that it resonates so well uh, and, and pulled me in personally was the use of remotes, the use of uh, triggered remotes that Joe, uh, obviously you both worked together to, to set up. Um, Joe, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, remote technology and how you utilize it to kind of give us a clearer vision of what these animals look like up close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, just to, to say at the beginning of the project, we did one long hike together, and then over the course of the two years, we, we more or less were, I mean, we're both kind of loners. So we're, we're both in the field alone, and then we correspond with each other and share information. And as, as far as the remote uh, camera traps, uh, these animals, they, they like to be in places where they can see far and see, fa or see far and run fast. And <clears throat> you can't, fo I mean, it's very difficult to photograph them when you're there. And my job was to, sh was to photograph this particular migration, this particular band of 400 animals that summers in Grand Teton National Park that forms one of the longest land mammal migrations in the Western Hemisphere. So uh, in order to show that, I had to photograph these, an these animals crossing rivers and in the mountains, because they're the only pronghorn that are found in those places. And <clears throat> in order to do that, I have to show the habitat. So I, have to sh so I either have to use a long lens, and so, so they're tiny animals in the landscape, or uh, I have to use a wide angle lens. And in order to use a wide angle, you have to be close to the animal. So, and there's no way you can get close to pronghorn. I mean, it's, it's just impossible. And they have vision that's 10 times better than us. And so <clears throat> in order to do this, I have to know where, the, where they're going to go. I have to predict where they're going to go within about three feet, because that's about the distance that I need to be. And um, <clears throat> so, so we'd figure out where their trails were, and then I'd put a, either a still camera or a video camera. Usually what I did is all the best spots, I put a still camera down on, and then the mediocre places I'd put a video camera down. And, and when I say put a camera down, I'd, it's the, with regard to the video cameras, it's just a normal little HD video camera. With a still camera, it's just a, a little DSLR nice camera with a nice wide angle lens. And then the remote unit is a separate unit. There's an infrared beam. Like this, um, this picture right here, you can kind of see the, on the left there, 
in the um, in the willows, there's a little box. But uh, so from there, it shoots an infrared beam across this this little trail, and then there's a cord that goes back to the camera. It tells the camera to start making pictures, and uh, that's how it works. The animal makes its own picture, and it doesn't know it's being photographed. Like this is a perfect example. Like these guys are the this. These pronghorn are the only pronghorn that ever ever going to be in a, like a willow thicket, and they're going to run through it because they don't know what's around there. I mean, there's there can be predators right there. Um, I think we have a sequence. Uh, maybe you can walk us through. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a so so I can so here's the progression of the cover picture. So this is the Green River crossing. Uh, <clears throat> this is a picture that. I knew I wanted to get in, in 2008 when, um, when Emmeline was doing work, she figured out, well, so with the GPS collars, we knew that they crossed the river within a, a stretch of about five miles. And then Emmeline went there in 2008 and spent a lot of time and figured out exactly which peninsula that they ran down and crossed the river. So then I set up a camera in 2009 to photograph this crossing. So, I need to photograph the animals coming out of the river with the river in the background. I need to show migration, so there has to be several animals. And so here's the first picture I get. It's mediocre. It's, it's about a half an hour after the sunset. They're all blurry, and plus there's too much land in the picture. Okay, go to the next one. So I move it over a little bit. I show more of the river. Uh, but there's no feel to it. All the animals are just little dots in the landscape. It, this, I mean, this is a wide-angle shot. They, had, they have to be close. So I decided to put the camera down a little bit lower in, in the water. So then I get this picture. Uh, it's midday. Uh, and for some reason, I like that rock because it, I mean, it just formed the left side of the picture nice. And, but it's two bucks, uh, which doesn't really show migration. I mean, they're, they're, they're in water, so they're obviously migrating, but the feel isn't there. They're probably just walking around looking for some females, but that's <laughs> just speculating. Okay, go to the next. So then here's the next picture I get, and uh, this definitely has the feel of migration. It's got more animals, um, but the light's lousy. You can see a little water speck on the lens <clears throat> right by the rock. And then, so this camera is there over the course of about a month and a half. And then, finally, on Cinco de Mayo at 7.15, uh, this is the picture I get. And this picture, uh, I mean, from my perspective, is, is well worth the, the two years working on this project. I mean, if I could do two-year-long projects for the rest of my life and end up with one frame like this on each project, I, I would die a happy dude, for sure. <laughs> and just the, the shadow on the rock and then how, how the animals are lined up behind her. And then the most important thing is, is the look on her face. And during migration, the does usually, there's one old doe that leads the way. And... <clears throat> She, the, the look on her face, she just knows what she's doing. She knows exactly where she's going, and she's leading the pack, and, and I feel like that picture tells that. So I'd love to um, follow up on what Joe just described about this photo. When, when this photo came up, all of you went, wow. Yeah. And um, I think it's interesting as someone who teaches conservation photography to really think about what makes this image so powerful. In reading Emmeline's story, I think we were all struck by the fact of how personal it was, how she brought us into this journey that she and her brother made, the direct observations that she made of the pronghorn antelope, and then weaving beautifully the scientific information again. So it was that personal quality, the journey, that she made that parallels the pronghorn's journey that really made us feel part of that story. Similarly, when we think of, when I th look at this photo, I think about how intensely personal it is. The use, Joe's choice to find, you know, this incredibly difficult space within three feet of where they would be crossing a river, that in itself is a coup. <laughs> but by placing a wide-angle lens so close to these animals, 
we get a sense of real intimacy. It becomes personal to us. Now, I can't help but be a neurobiologist for one second. And our brains judge distance based on size. Now, we can make anything huge by using a big telephoto lens, right? So you guys could take a telephoto picture of me and Joe, and we would it would be up close and personal. But if I were to take a step forward onto the stage and you take that picture, I wouldn't look that much bigger than Joe, right? Because you're far away taking that picture. And with a telephoto lens, there is a sense of distance, a little sense of neutrality. You put a wide angle lens right up next to this doe, she looks huge, just like the heads in front of the in the row in front of you look so much bigger than we do, right? Because your brain is basically saying, I know this person sitting in front of me is not huge compared to the tiny person at the back. It's the way we assess proximity. And by having that camera so close and this doe looks so big, we get the sense of being in her world at her feet. And then Joe just got the biggest bang for the buck with this beautiful light the splash of the water, so we get this real sense of the dynamism, the whole herd scattered in the background, the landscape, the clouds. I mean, this is just, I can only imagine, I, I said to him on the phone, well, I won't repeat exactly what I said, but I said, you must have been very excited when you got to the camera and saw this photo, because it has everything you want to bring us into a story. Thank you. So moving along with that idea, uh, obviously pictures like this were actually not possible without some developments in technology. As you mentioned yourself, uh, they, these animals have incredible vision and they're uh, incredibly skittish. Without the idea of remotes, this couldn't have happened. And I think now we're going to move to a video which uh, also highlights this collaboration of new technology along with uh, hands on the ground observation being able to give us more insight about animals. Now I have some scientists on the stage with me so please correct me if I'm wrong, but let's show the video here and while it plays I'll tell you what you're watching. Um, now this is basically a visualization that shows the flight path of a stork as it was recorded by a GPS chip. Yeah. This is an oliver die anderhalf uur lang achter een zaaiende boer aanloopt. So this is recording the flight Tegen path of the stork, wil die as recorded by a GPS chip. Hij maakt slim gebruik van onze sporen. Now the data here de termiek boven gives de us amazing intelligence tot about what's happening, but until we correlate that with observations on the ground, we don't exactly know what we're seeing. Now maybe what we'll do is we'll, have, we'll play one more time, but the interesting thing that we're seeing here is when the stork, when this video started and the stork was going back and forth on the field, what it was doing is it was following a tractor. Uiteindelijk now the tractor hij een hoogte van 310 meter. Om dan in één lange yeah, we'll glijvlucht met meer dan 60 km sound. per uur terug te keren naar zijn nest. Okay, so there's once. We'll do it again because a little technical difficulty. In total, and I'll explain a little bit what's going on. Okay, so here what you're seeing is the stork going back and forth. What it's doing is it's following a tractor that is running over insects and disorienting them. The stork then can eat these insects much, much easier as they have just been, you know, disoriented. The stork now what it's doing is it's moving to fly above the thermal output put off by a railroad track so that heat is helping the stork gain altitude and fly faster. What then happens is the stork then circles around to gain more altitude, and we can tell by the GPS chip that at some point it flies uh, almost 60 kilometers an hour, and that during this whole flight path for the day, it goes about 12 kilometers in that day. And this is all information that these GPS chip technologies can now make available, but without the corroboration of that information of what's happening on the ground, you wouldn't have that full idea of what the life of this stork is in that day. So what I'd love to hear from the panel is, you know, with the new technology like this that is coming out or is, you know, either emergent or existing, where do you see this taking us? Where do you see this taking the science? Well, I, I think that there are, there are two things going on here. One is simultaneously we're being brought closer to the lives of these organisms and what's going on both in the landscape and in their particular habitats. At the same time, we're doing it by increasing our distance from them. 
and that's a, a very interesting tension. And I think it has um, several different implications. I know that at, at, at Jasper Ridge, since we've put in uh, a lot of wireless remote cameras and videos, it's really altered our perception of what's going on at the preserve, and it's altered our relationship to the animals, and in a peculiar sort of way, it makes it easier for us, even as scientists, to anthropomorphize what's going on, because in a sense, we see what they do as organisms, and it makes sense to us as organisms in ways that didn't occur before. And one of the examples I would use is that for a couple years, there was a whole system of remote cameras out at the preserve, and during that two years, and these were film cameras, and they were being maintained by volunteers, and during those two years, we didn't get a single image of a mountain lion. And all those cameras were evenly distributed across the preserve. So then the next time it was done, we actually put the cameras where people like to go, just because we were curious to see what was going on on the trails and roads. And lo and behold, they use the same paths that we do <laughs> for exactly the same reasons, the path of least resistance. And at least that's how I interpret it. <laughs> and so it really has changed our understanding of what's going on, about the amount of activity that's going on, and how we need to understand the systems that are there in ways that I don't think we could have predicted before. And it has even had impacts on our policies and how we think about managing a preserve. So it's been really quite dramatic. And if we think about um, the same types of wildlife outside of Jasper Ridge, I mean, I think many of us here in the Stanford community are aware that there are mountain lions that are populating, you know, the whole Santa Cruz uh, mountain range. Um, and we have understood very little about how many mountain lions there are, how, uh, over what areas they're moving. Um, but with collaring, by placing um, satellite tracking collars onto a couple of dozen lions, we're starting to get information from those collars that reveal the extensive migration patterns of these cats in, in our area. Um, and this is going to be essential because as the local habitat for these mountain lions in the Bay Area has become highly fragmented, the more we understand where they're trying to move and when they're running into danger, like trying to cross Highway 17, mountain lions getting killed by cars on the road, the better we'll be able to address some of the issues that are similar to the issues that uh, the pronghorn antelope migration uh, story addressed. In understanding the migration corridors that animals actually use, we'll be better equipped to address and rectify through constructing um, migration uh, overpasses um, and through preserving certain habitats that we know are under intensive use. So maybe if we bring it back to the pronghorn piece, uh, one of the threads in that piece obviously was the idea of wildlife versus uh, urban accommodation. Uh, there's this conflict between the migration route and the impact of human development, you know, whether it be fences, whether it be highways. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you saw during that piece and that, that conflict, and then maybe talk about if or, or can a balance be reached between those two? Yeah, so this migration is kind of unique because it's so long. It's 170 miles from end to end, and the animals are using pretty much the exact same path every spring and fall when they migrate. And this 175 or 170 mile long path is crossing a whole bunch of different land jurisdictions. It starts in Grand Teton National Park in the summer range up in the, at the north end, and they enter National Forest. And there's about 45 miles that go through the Bridger Teton National Forest. And that piece of land has actually been set aside as a national migration corridor through the effort of a whole bunch of different people who knew about the migration were interested in protecting it. So that's, that's one path is to designate a migration corridor, which has happened in that first half of this pathway. And that designation just basically means any development that happens in the national forest has to happen in a way that allows the migration to continue. It can't obstruct the migration or interrupt the animals while they're migrating. But then they, they come down 45 miles to the south and they reach the boundary of the national forest. They cross onto this matrix of private and Bureau of Land Management land. 
And that is one of the most vulnerable points in the migration corridor, I would say. There's a subdivision right at the forest boundary, and there are already quite a few roads and fences through there. It's also a part of the state that's seeing a huge population boom because it's the same county as some extensive natural gas fields. So there are a lot of people moving to that part of Wyoming to, move, to work in the gas fields and they are buying land, putting up fences, building houses, adding driveways, building corrals for their horses, putting up shops, they have dogs, all these things. So that kind of pressure is happening throughout this matrix of private and Bureau of Land Management land. Then the animals come down and they cross a pretty major highway that sees a lot of traffic from that gas development. And that's the most dangerous point in the migration corridor for these animals that I talked about before where we first saw them cross under the fences. And then once they get south of the highway, they're in the gas fields, which have wintertime development. So that's their winter range, but there's traffic and uh, pipelines and everything there through year round. So that's a challenging place for them as well. So uh, these animals are crossing all these different types of land, lots of jurisdictional boundaries, going through people's yards. But there has been so much attention to this migration that there's little things people are, are starting to do that are really helping the migration continue. And that would be leaving gates open during the spring and fall migration. I mean, that's a, that's a minor thing, but if the gate doesn't need to be closed, if there's not cattle in that pasture at that time of year, it makes a huge difference for the animals to have the gate open. There's also a land trust in that part of the state that got a bunch of funding and they were able to retrofit fences on these ranches for free to be wildlife friendly so they could remove old um, outdated fences that were really hard for the animals to cross and replace them with fences that have the bottom wire a little bit higher above the ground and no barbs on it. And uh, that was, it was a huge effort on the part of that land trust, but it's a small change to human occupation of that area that helps the animals continue to move through. So those are some of the kinds of changes that um, it, it's like once people understand that migration is happening and sort of what it takes, there's little kind of tweaks that uh, people were able to make in that area to help the animals continue to move through. And when Emmeline talks about uh, the fence retrofitting, this picture is a picture of a wildlife friendly fence. It, the bottom wire is at least 16 inches off the ground because pronghorn usually, because they can't jump or they don't like to jump, they go under fences. But this just shows you that just because it's wildlife friendly, there are still stress levels on the pronghorn. And I mean, I mean the, the bottom line with this migration is that it's still happening, but we don't know how much development it can take. And once it's gone, it's gone. So that, and, and those are questions we don't know, it's just how much development can it take? How, I mean, how many people can, can live around these animals? But there's, there's things that the people can do who live there, and um, that's one thing that was very rewarding for our project was just was to talk with the people who live right in the middle of the corridor that they work during the day and they don't know that these animals are there. I mean, the, these animals, a lot of times, like in the fall, they'll cross through, some, they'll, someone will be living right in the corridor, they'll cross through for five minutes and then they're gone. So these people are at work, and they don't know that they their house is right in the middle of a corridor. So they so it's just that that was one thing about our project that was very rewarding was to help the people understand what they have right in their backyard. And uh, let's just say maybe to localize it, we can talk about you. Know, you'd mentioned that uh, not five miles from campus we have uh, mountain lions on the preserve, and you know when these were photographed fairly recently, uh, there was a lot of excitement, but there was also a lot of concern. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that. Yeah, there was actually a lot of concern. <laughs> and what we ended up doing is we uh, worked with Rising Environmental Leaders Network program here at Stanford in the Woods Institute, and we got together um, five graduate students and postdocs from different departments and disciplines and asked them to assess what the presence of mountain lions meant at the preserve and what kinds of policy changes we, sh we should put together. And they actually put together a fabulous report that was uh, 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 
presented to us in 2011 with a lot of recommendations that were extremely valuable. But one of the things I found really interesting is as they were looking at the camera trap data, they're able to actually make estimates on how frequently mountain lions run a preserve and how their patterns were changing in response to people. We, it became really clear as you're looking at the, the dates and times of a lot of the photos that even the mountain lions were adjusting when they were on mountains and trails. It seemed to specifically avoid us. I mean, it was a, very, it was a really interesting pattern. And they were also there mu much more frequently than we expected. But based on the patterns of their behavior and the frequency they're in the preserve, we figured an encounter was about a one in 10 million shot. So, it, but perception drives policies way more than uh, real risk sure. likelihood. And it raises the more general issue of human-animal conflict and how we can ask ourselves and others to sort of coexist with, with predators and with animals that are known to pose dangers, especially to, to children. Many of you who've lived in this community for a while are aware that several years ago, a young mountain lion, probably a non-territorial male, wandered into the um, suburban neighborhood in Palo Alto, was treed by a dog. Uh, an elementary school was about to let out and the community police force made the decision to shoot the animal. Just a couple months ago, a pair of very young mountain lions uh, were in a similar situation in Half Moon Bay and were shot. Um, it, I find it really, you know, someone who's um, sort of worked on African lion conservation issues, the sort of idea that will ask others in other communities to find a way to live with dangerous animals that can threaten their safety or threaten their crops, lions, elephants. Um, we sort of expect that of other cultures, and yet what we've done here in California is eradicate grizzly bears, right, from the face of the state. And our first response to mountain lions is often to go in with firearms and, and protect Children. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that children ought not to be protected. <laughs> of course they should. But sure I was do. really impressed by a story that a friend of mine told me. She has children in Portola Valley in a school that has a lot of deer on the campus. And there are mountain lion signs, um, you know, not frequently, but occasionally near the school boundary. And that school's response, I think, is very sensible. The children don't go out for recess if a mountain lion has been cited, obviously, or if there's any signs of the lion. And so um, one of the things that I think this issue of knowing the number of big cats that we're trying to coexist with might raise is to um, develop sort of more sensible policies for how to treat encounters um, that will protect the cats and our kids at the same time. Yeah, and I, I would also say that even beyond the issue of predators, it's, I mean, the most optimistic thing about the technology is it, it might provide a new way for us to um, get a sense that we share this place with other organisms. I think that, I mean, we often talk about how technology isolates us from the environment, but it would really be nice to see this used in ways that it rekindles those connections because I think there's a lot to be gained there. And I think it's something that um, we all sort of suffer a certain detachment from that we need to rekindle. Sure. Well, to bring this back to the pronghorn, there's been some recent developments uh, with the story. And uh, I'm not going to steal anyone's thunder. I'm going to let you two tell us uh, what has happened uh, recently with this the outcomes of the story and uh, and uh, the migration route. Okay, so the, this picture is from 2009. Uh, this was a typical, this spot's called Trapper's Point. This is Highway 191, the highway that feeds up to Jackson Hole and Grand Teton and Yellowstone down to, to I-80. It's a major highway. And <clears throat> this was a typical, this was a typical scene in, in October in, in Wyoming, right here. And this is 2009, and uh, just this past year in 2012, uh, a whole bunch of different groups, a lot of people came together, and it was primarily the work of the Wyoming Department of Transportation. There was two wildlife overpasses built, and 
uh, six underpasses for deer. So this is an overpass at Trapper's Point. That picture, <laughs> the, the last picture you saw, those, animal, those pronghorn were at the top of the right side of that bridge. So now the cars go underneath, the animals go over the top. At, at this spot, <clears throat> was there a hundred um, vehicle collisions a year? Was that I think it was? it was even more than that. Yeah. yeah. So it Along was, this 12 mile stretch. So the, so the Wyoming Department of Transportation estimates that over the court, that in 12 years that they'll make their money back because of all the vehicle collisions, it'll be um, <clears throat> just from a money perspective and then also, I mean, it's way safer for people. And obviously, it's way better for migrating pronghorn and deer. So this is an example of, of what we can do to improve the landscape. And this is just the beginning of or the, this whole idea of overpasses and underpasses from the highways. I mean, highways are the, that, they are what fragments the landscape. And <clears throat> here, here's a video of a nice big group of, of pronghorn going over the top. So if you can imagine a big truck coming right now. Can you give us a glimpse maybe to how you feel the piece help the policy decision or any feedback that maybe you received about how it affected the policy? I, I talked to the Wyoming Department of Transportation about that and there were a couple of things they were considering. Um, in order to justify the expense, they needed to show that it was gonna be saving money also, like Joe just described. But they also wanted to be assured that if they went to the effort of building these structures, the rest of the migration corridor would remain intact into the future so that the animals would be there to use the structures. So they were looking at work from different conservation groups. They looked at the um, protected migration corridor the forest put in place and they looked at work the land trusts had done. They also needed uh, evidence that the public cared about this issue and wanted these kind of structures built. And they, we can't say that there was an exact cause and effect, but um, Joe and I put together a presentation about the project that told the story of this migration and we showed it in communities all around Wyoming, um, elementary schools. We went to the Bureau of Land Management agencies and showed it to their staff um, and also just to public people who came to a library one Friday night to see our presentation. So we really reached a lot of people and during the kind of couple of years all of this was happening, this became a recognized state story that people were engaged with and, and cared about and understood and talked about and it showed up in newspapers and lots of places. So um, there was just this building momentum coming from a whole bunch of different sides that allowed these structures to be completed just a few months ago. I think that's, to me, it's the tr it's the truth with most with most with most journalism is that you don't know what impact you're really having. You, you're not sure, you know, who's seeing your pictures or who's reading your words. But with this migration, no one had had documented it in our style of documentation before, and it, it's it's pretty hard to save a place or to conserve a place. I mean, if you can't visualize it in your mind or you don't know what you're trying to conserve because the vast majority of the general public, even the locals, didn't know really what it looked like. I mean, they see pronghorn here and there, but um, yeah, so it feels good to be, I mean, to be able to show people what it is like, And but it definitely wasn't just us, I don't think, but I think it helped. You know, this is definitely uh, an example of depth reporting. You know, it took several years, several trips, uh, and it's something that, uh, is becoming more and more difficult increasingly with uh, the media landscape. Can you talk maybe a little bit about uh, your thoughts uh, about any concern of the viability of these types of stories or do you see them um, running into problems moving forward with getting funding? I know you were partially funded by grants, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the, the hope for more of these type stories moving forward. Well, it was High Country News that uh, published our story eventually, and uh, they are a nonprofit news organization that is kept alive by subscriptions and donations and grants, and they sort of bring all that together to be able to put these kind of stories out there. So that was sort of one 
element of it, thinking about future viability, I feel like uh, there is some movement towards more nonprofit type of venues for these sort of longer stories. Um, also, I guess I would just say that um, this story did take a lot of time, and I think it kind of stands out as far as wildlife reporting because we spent so many days out in the field, spread over so many years, trying to figure out how the story worked and really put the time in to get the whole story. Uh, it's like, because anybody can publish anything on the internet or even self-publish and print these days, um, the, the publishing is less the issue and the, the really taking the long time to generate a, a complex and complete story is sort of what's more rare. And I don't think that is gonna disappear at all. In fact, I think it's gonna become more and more valuable as uh, putting stories out there gets easier and easier. The, the really rich long form stories I think will, um, yeah, will have even more meaning in that context. Okay. Well, why don't we have one more question of the panel, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, the I think we have a video too. Um, I, if if we could talk about you know as technology develops increasingly fast pace, the the cost of these uh, remote triggered devices has dropped, and I think uh, and maybe Sue, you can jump in. There's there's a video that we can show here, which uh, is actually of your backyard. Is that right? Yeah. So one of the things that I think is worth emphasizing, and it really connects to what. Uh, Emily and Joe were talking about, you know, families um, not knowing that pronghorn were in their own backyard. And while the kinds of traps that Joe's uh, using and constructing are not inexpensive, for less than $200, people like you and me can get a little camera trap and really discover the environments in which we live. So a couple of years ago, I set up a small camera uh, trap, um, cost less than $200 literally outside of my bedroom window and saw that I live here on Stanford campus in the faculty ghetto with an amazing uh, variety of animals um, that were coming up to my bedroom window. Um, and I felt so much more connected with um, the wildlife that lives in my backyard. Now, not all of the animals in my backyard are wild. Um, there were an extraordinary variety of local house cats that are of some concern, <laughs> given the number of songbirds and rodents that they eat. And of somewhat even more concern, um, you can imagine how I felt <laughs> when I downloaded my camera SD card and saw that guy. Um, so it doesn't cost a lot of money, but really, you know, despite the surprise at the end, which is still of some concern, <laughs> the idea that we live in our suburban houses in ways that actually are conducive to very rich ecosystems in our backyard, I think for me was a tremendous discovery. Um, and uh, it makes me feel more committed to understanding the full range of animals from charismatic mountain lions to opossums and to um, animals that are passing through and to understand how we can sort of support their existence um, in the places where we live. <laughs> That's not my backyard. <laughs> if, and then I, I would just add that, you know, in the 20 years, <laughs> in the 20 years, almost 20 years I've been at Jasper Ridge, I don't think anything has generated more public interest in the preserve than the wildlife videos and photos we've been posting on our website. It's been remarkable how much, um, interest that is generated. And I think most people are intrinsically interested in what the other is like. And suddenly we realize that we're surrounded by the other and that's both cool as well as a little scary at times. And I think that's um, a really, really healthy thing to have happen. Okay. Well, with that, we have a couple minutes left, so I want to open it up for uh, questions of the audience. So if you have any questions, I believe we have just one mic here in the center that uh, please, Okay, let's do this, it's even closer. Um, 
um, our photojournalists and researchers. Can you tell us what you're doing now or what your plans are for the future? And you mentioned that the research is or the process is perhaps more important than the possibility of publishing now since that's easier. But what do you see as the viability for this kind of in-depth as well as to some extent high-tech nature reporting? Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I guess what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm planning to go back and work in Western Wyoming uh, next year on elk and, and deer migrations. But, so I'm essentially working on three projects. I'm, I'm a full-time photographer now. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be working in Wyoming and then I also have two stories that I've been working on. I just got back from Argentina where I'm working on a, a, a story on, on uh, the vicuña, which is a camelid and its interaction with the puma in a really remote place in the Andes, in the West Central Andes that's impacted by some large gold deposits, the largest gold mine in the world will go into production next year. And then I'm also working on my first story for National Geographic magazine on the, the Gobi bear, which is the rarest bear in the world. There's 22 left in the Gobi desert and uh, they're impacted by gold as well. And uh, <clears throat> so there's, there's 22 of those guys left and I'm heading back there in April and that story will print next year. And uh, so, and the other part of the question was oh, this type of project. And well, I guess first of all, there needs to be, there needs to be interest for and for journalists to do long for nat long form natural history reporting, and I mean, there's just not very many people that are, from my perspective, that are interested in doing this type of reporting. I mean, there's, as far as the young up and coming natural history writers that are essentially, you know, telling the story of the animal and not just the science or or the researchers. I mean, there, there's Emmeline and there's a couple other people. And as far as the young conservation photographers that want to do projects like this, I mean, I don't know a lot of people who, who will spend a lot of time on one, you know, and not, I mean, we weren't paid for this. Well, when we were starting it, we weren't paid. I mean, we were just getting our bottom line expenses covered. And it's tough to get those grants more and more. I mean, there's more and more people applying for them. Um, these types of conservation stories, um, on the one hand, it's maybe harder to find funding for them just because there's not a huge funding pool out there for this type of work. But on the other hand, if, it's a, if it is a very compelling um, story, like one thing that worked well with our pronghorn story was that it kind of combined elements of adventure, um, the journey story, natural history, and conservation, and it all came together in a nice way. And we had uh, support from a really wide range of, of funders who helped us dedicate so much time to it. Every, everything from um, the University of Wyoming, different departments at the University of Wyoming, to the Grand Teton Association gave me a grant, and then also the Banff Center and National Geographic supported us, the National Association of Nature Photographers, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. Um, so we kind of, we cast our net far and wide, and uh, because the story was compelling, we were able to find support for it, for sure. I, I want to add a note of concern, though, um, and just sort of, first of all, notice the obvious. Um, these guys are still both very young and can afford to take financial risks on a long story like this. And Joe didn't even want to have a real job. So it, was, <laughs> it all worked out really, really well. Um, for the people, you know, photojournalists who are, are a couple decades ahead who are trying to support families, this has become a brutal existence for doing these deep, long stories because so few venues are willing to pay for them. And more and more magazines that are publishing text stories about wildlife and conservation, and now I'm thinking more about the photography angle, are simply illustrating their stories with stock photography. So I am concerned about the future of photojournalism in this area and to the extent that print media, other media, are gonna be able to support the livelihoods of people who are devoting their careers to this essential work. Um, I think there are some red flags up there that are worth attending to. Question back here. 
Uh, hi, Joe, Emily, uh, fantastic work. Um, curious, you were both in college when you first started this. Did you get any pushback like, well, this is a little ambitious for college students? Did you, what gave you that confidence to think so big and bold and, you know, turned out to be a several year project and such great work? I was getting my Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction Writing and Environment and Natural Resources while I worked on it, and uh, I didn't have pushback. I think it was to my advantage to be a student because there were some funding sources that were available to me specifically as a student, and I also had the support of my Creative Writing Thesis Committee um, who was helping me kind of work through the story. So in that way, uh, in that way it was to my advantage to be a student, actually. Yeah, and as far as any pushback from me either, I, I mean, I didn't have any, but I also had, had never, I mean, this was more or less my first project, and um, so I hadn't ever really done anything before, and, and I mean, for, and my goal was to get, like, between 10 and 15 frames that I thought were good enough in, over the course of two years, so that, I guess, isn't that ambitious, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, that's so... I mean, at the beginning, no one, it, it was just like we were going to do our project and not very many people knew about it and we were just going to go do our thing and go hike around and see what we can find. So, I mean, it's only now that people even know about it, you know, so. Hi there. Uh, I'm running a research project down in the Bay, Baylands over here uh, on the Gray Fox. I've been at it for three years now, going on four, and it's a long-term project on the behavior of the gray fox. I was wondering, because we're using trail cameras out there, I was wondering what kinds of trail cameras you used, mm -hmm. Joe? Yeah, well, as far as equipment, I use just a regular DSLR camera, like just a little DSLR with a wide angle. So. I mean, typically on the small sensor cameras, I, I'd shoot around 12 millimeter. Was it like 12 to 14 millimeter? And so that's the camera. So the camera is just like, I mean, how, how I look at it is it's just a normal camera, and I pick the spot, like the best spot I can find. If I was laying on a trail or wherever, I just find the best spot and put the camera there where I can envision the best picture that can be made. And then the, and then it's a separate infrared beam that just connects to the motor drive of the camera. But, um, what about the video? So, so the video, they're, they're little, just like little HD video cameras that have a remote. So those, those cameras I, weren't owned by me, those were geographic cameras because I, I got those from a grant I got from them. So I had five cameras from the geographic that, and, and those were triggered by a wireless um, trigger. So I'd set up the trigger down the trail um, a couple hundred feet, and, and with the video, you just get the camera rolling before it comes into the frame as far as the remote. So they're much easier to, to do. The still pictures are much harder to get a, a nice camera trap picture. I mean, for every one good camera trap picture I have, I have thousands of stuff that just doesn't look right. It, you know, is that frame off in the video or is it still? Yeah, no, this is a still picture. Yeah. Question back here. I just want to thank the panel and uh, the moderator for an insightful conversation. I, I couldn't help but overhear a lot of laughter and joy when we were watching those videos of the animals. And a lot of people feel, uh, even with that skunk, uh, just a sense of awe and I wonder about the connection that we could have in a better way through your work, um, conservation, uh, and and these images and these, this capturing of animals. How and in what ways do you see uh, our work to remove obstacles for migrating animals uh, connected to this? And and I work for the Nature Conservancy, and, and one of our projects in the Wyoming, with the Wyoming Land Trust kind of centers around this. And, you know, one of the most popular things that we have is this eagle cam in Santa Cruz Island. We have more people going to see these birds that come back to the same nest every year. 
and I, I just can't help but think that this work that you're doing could help conservation and might be a means of support for more of the kind of journalism that you're doing. So I was just curious to your thoughts. Well, um, I mean, from my perspective, that I mean, the pictures are to get people interested, but really in the end, I mean, for me, the only thing that matters is if the animals are gonna continue being wild um, or not. And uh, <clears throat> so that's my goal. Um, and uh, I think this work's important. I mean, more, more and more, as there's more and more people having more and more activity on the planet, there's just gonna be more conflicts with us humans being humans and then all the other things that are living on this planet. So this type of journalism, <clears throat> from my perspective, is it's really important. I mean, it's important. It's, it's bringing more or less the science into our daily lives and letting us make a decision. Are we going to are we going to continue and just take over the planet and kill everything else off or not? And and it's the same. Like I think it's important too with the, with all this new, I mean, this new type of of wildlife research when we're collaring animals. It, I mean, it's it's providing more information for us, which is important. But it's really only important if it ends up in conservation. If it just ends up in more information for the human species to think about, it's. Um, I mean, I don't think that's the point. The point is to conserve. So that's really it. Um, that's really when, it, and, and that's the, I mean, in, in other parts of the world when there's a lot of collaring involved, that's, that's what needs to happen is it needs to end up in conservation. And it doesn't always end up in that. It, a lot of times it just ends up in a journal article and then the species ends and then that's it. But I think more and more this, the role of journalism linking the general public to science is it's gonna become increasingly important and there has to be more and more people that get into it. And the fun, and there's, and, it, the, and with coming back to the funders, I mean, there's a lot of fun, from my perspective, there's a lot of money available for wildlife research in, and especially in comparison to journalism. And I, I sure hope, I don't know, us as a society can figure out how to bring that bring some funding and how wildlife lives their lives into our lives and think about it more. Can I just add that um, Stephen Jay Gould, you know, one of the planet's most prominent biologists um, and champions of biodiversity uh, said once, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase this and I'll botch it because the, the words he used were much more elegant, but he basically said, we will not fight to preserve what we do not love. And I think your question really speaks so strongly to what Emmeline and Joe have done so successfully in this story is that they've told us, you know, Emmeline told us about her journey. She showed us these uh, pronghorn antelopes through her words. Joe made incredibly powerful images. We start to feel connected with these animals. Um, and I think we have big hearts. And the more we see, the more we hear, the more we understand, the, the, the more prominent a place these animals and habitats occupy in our hearts. And for me, if we feel strongly, it's first of all in, in instilling emotion. Because if we care, we might act. If we don't care, we won't. And that to me is what they've done so beautifully in this piece. They've really made us care deeply. And, and the, the other dimension I, 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 I really appreciated the TNC uh, person and the question, I've looked at that Santa Cruz Island eagle nest on, on uh, several occasions. And I actually think that one of the really powerful aspects of it that you're touching on is that when we see it and we are able to locate it in place and time, we're able to attach grief to the loss of that thing. And I think that sometimes is really important. I, it's, it's really, really easy to be insulated from ever having to go through the grief of the fact that we've lost something that actually has value and beauty to it. And I think that's part of that connection is you see this, we know it's there, and suddenly we realize if it's gone that there is a real loss. And it's hard to make that connection when you are never aware of it and you don't know how important it is. 
Time for one more question. You guys have spoken eloquently about um, how technology allowed you to get this story, the collaring and the uh, photo photographic equipment. But I'm wondering the other side of that, the <laughs> other part of the digital revolution, I mean, the push in journalism towards making everything available for the iPhone and the iPad. Did you have to think through that in doing this project? And as you go ahead in future projects, do you have to think through how this will play in the mobile digital revolution? Or is it a, you know, is, is wildlife journalism something that's just not as compatible yet to taking full advantage of, of that? And I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, as, as far as thinking if my pictures were going to work or not on the iPad, I, I, at the beginning of the project, I, I, mean, I didn't think it, I mean, all I thought about is I need to get 15 pictures in the next two years, and, and I hope to have a good time along the way. <laughs> so that, so that, that was my thought process. But nowadays, I am. Now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm shooting more video, and I'm trying to make things, make my, well, the projects I work on, it's essentially just bringing wildlife and their story and like what's happening to them and making it cool so people are interested. I mean, uh, um, and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, for this project, we definitely just focused on the big story and that seemed to work well here, but, uh, it, we had the advantage of being able to give this multimedia presentation all around the state with support from the Humanities Council, and that that was pretty interesting how powerful and meaningful those presentations were. So that's like one more step to kind of how can we use technology to tell this story. And uh, as time goes by, there's more and more tools to do that, more ways to reach larger audiences uh, more thoroughly and to tell stories in different ways. And all the, all the different um, media for getting the story out to the public is kind of another step after the work of, or maybe alongside at the same time as the work of figuring out what the story is or figuring out how the antelope are getting across the river. They're, they're, they're a little bit of um, two separate pieces to the project, but I think it's a really good point and absolutely necessary um, if we if we care about these things that we've been talking about of helping people understand what wildlife is up to and getting them to care about it enough that they'll you know maybe even change their behavior and do something that we can reach more and more audiences with some of these different media and technologies that are available for sure. It's almost like kind of a progression where so there's a scientist out there putting radio collars on things or setting camera traps. There's journalists um, who might be doing field work like we did and um, trying to observe animals on the ground. And there's also people who might be some of those same people trying to bridge the, the data and the information from those camera traps to audiences and just trying to disperse that to larger and larger audiences. So all those pieces are, I think, necessary part of the process. So I want to thank the, uh, the panel members, Philippe Cohen, Sue McConnell, Joe Reese, Emily Nosland, and moderator Sam Stewart. I want to thank some people who made this possible, Robin Evans of the Knight Fellowships, um, and Laura Ma and Kathy Zanana of the Lane Center, and especially Jeff McGee, who organized all this, um, did all the visual work. Um, with the added uh, obstacle, migration obstacle, of, of being a, a new father only two weeks ago. <laughs> this is his first day back from paternity leave. Uh, and I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, hope that you look forward for... Could, excuse me. could we also mention the presence of Joan Lane before we oh, leave? Because yes. their family was so important to this whole center and everything. Yes, Joan Lane, um, uh, please stand up. Thank you for thank you for that. So thank you for coming and we hope to see you here next year. <laughs>